All right, recording in progress. Great. Thanks for the update. Uh, it's, it's There Will Be Bourbon Part 2 with Ross Kennedy. And it's still fueled by America's Native Spirit, only this time we're just we're just straight old fashioning it at this point. So I know you have the okay. Cheers. Yeah, cheers to that. I've got the I've got the decanter. I got the matching glasses. I got a glass somewhere that's got like the bullet, you know, etched into it or whatever. So I think my brother's got those glasses with the you talking about the ones with the bullet in it, like inside. Yeah, they have like a yeah, it's like the glasses blown yeah, around it or whatever. I feel like everybody that drinks whiskey has had that glass at one point in their in their trek along the, the path of whiskey. Um, you gotta, you gotta have it, man. It's, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's like the cool guy thing to do. It's, yeah. It's I got one more day before I shave this monstrosity of a mustache off. It's just, it's just stealing half the bourbon that I sip. So it's glorious. <laughs> it is. Um, and I can't do anything here though. So that's the problem. Otherwise I would just go full beard and, and do that. But <laughs> I did not get the beard gene. I just got the mustache gene. Yeah. See, you got, you got the right one. Plus your hair is dark. So it's even better. I just got like all this shit right now, this whole year has decided to turn gray. Never had that. Or it helps if you're blonde though. Yeah. But my beard is like, it's like red. <laughs> it's like more red than anything. And then now it's got the gray in it. So yeah, I'm very, you look like, you look like a wise Viking shaman. <laughs> I don't know how wise I am. I get wiser the more I drink, I think, but. Well, that's a failure we all have, brother. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we're going to segue back into kind of where we picked up. Um, and, yep. and what you were talking about was uh, the type of individual who wants to be or who we need in the military is is uh, those who would not be willing to kind of go along with this false meritocracy. Right. Um, and I guess it, I know you kind of laid that out, but I think my follow up to that would be if they're leaving. They're not having their 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 kids join. Um, we still have very large foreign policy goals, right? We still toy yeah. around with the idea of a two front war and still being able to do that. Now we get it, you know, warfare is changing. You have the whole digital transformation going on. A lot of that stuff's gonna take place no matter what. But in the face of that, what you said which is a reality as well in the face of also the recruiting challenges that all the, like every branch is having, how are they going to fight it? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, if we, if we assume from the outset that they do want to fight a war, which, you know, the U S is just perpetually a country at war. It's kind of what we do. So we can probably mm -hmm. safely, uh, safely assume that there will be future wars and somebody's going to have to fight them. Um, my gut is, is that there's actually going to be a, a process that happens. And, and we're already seeing the transformation underway. Ukraine has been uh, a playground of yeah. new, new ideas, new concepts of warfare, in some cases, old concepts adapted to new technology. Um, we're seeing how $300 commercial off the shelf drones are taking out whole tanks. They're, there's kamikaze drones running dudes down on bikes and blowing them up. And, you know, so the U.S. has to grapple with this. You know, we have the most expensively trained warfighter in the world at an individual per man level. And yet, if our tactics and if the way we respond to that doesn't adapt quickly enough, then these guys that cost $500,000 or a million dollars to train and equip uh, or multiple of them at once can get taken out. Um, you know, if a $4 million swarm of kamikaze drones can, you know, knock an aircraft carrier out of commission by pepper in the deck, you know, uh, you know, the Japanese did it, in a, you know, in World War II with whole planes and, and human pilots. And we don't, we don't have yeah, to do that now. It's interesting. You know? So, so you have to grapple with that and you say, how much do we invest in a man when, when the scalability of warfare has never been both cheaper and, and more pervasive at disintermediating the man in the loop, uh, both from a defensive side and from an offensive side. So we're seeing that transformation go underway. We're, we're spending money on all these really Gucci bespoke types of platforms and uh, disruptive things. And we, at the end of the day, we don't really still have an answer for, you know, our certain, you know, our naval surface fleet for point defense. If, if, you know, just a huge volley of missiles and drones got lobbed all at once uh, from a commercial container ship that appeared yeah. to be completely benign right up until it, it started launching. Right. Um, so we have to grapple with that. And then the other thing that we have to grapple with is to what extent can 
the commercial sector be utilized as a force multiplier. In World War II, we had the advantage of being able to build the arsenal of liberty. We converted all of our auto factories, we converted our shipyards, we converted everything and just poured every single resource and, and industrial capacity that we had into creating machines of war. And we still have to do that to some extent, but you know, the, the new machines of war are actually areas where the U.S. has a, has a scalability advantage if we choose to lean into it. And, and that's some of these, these new, uh, yeah, you have the exquisite stuff, but you got the really cheap low rent stuff that we, we could repurpose some of our industrial manufacturing capability to begin churning things out that, that can tip the balance. But all of that to say, you, you still have to have a man in the chair who's willing to call the shots. Yeah. You still have to have targeteers. Um, the, the, there, there will have to emerge from the private sector, from, the pool of civilian populations um, and, and thus DOD and the intelligence community are going to have to grapple with integrating these people as well, because we won't be able to fight the next war without them, not a big one. And these are the misfits. These are the, the malcontents. These are the people that I'm not talking about people that we pull out of jail and give them the gun and the plate carrier and say, you know, go, go, go do cool guy shit. Um, you know, tier one, tier one guys, you know, are, are and always will be, at least for, for as long as I can see into the future, a huge competitive advantage for us. Or, yeah. you know, the U.S. does the U.S. does commando shit better than anybody in the world. That's one part of the domain, but the other part of the domain is going to be taking the Palmer Luckies, the Elon Musks, and yeah. and the hundreds of thousands of other individuals that the you know they've never worn the flag on the shoulder, but they've got it in their heart, yeah. and integrate them into a war fighting system that that's built around you know, repetitive training, exquisite technology and platforms, materiel, and say, how do we allow these, these crazy uh, outlier individuals? How do we allow the, the uh, autistic guy that maybe has zero like social integration capability, but is just a fucking whiz with a certain type of technology? Like how do we integrate yeah. them into the effort? And, and for me, I look at that and I, and I think that the DOD should, return to a meritocratic state, but we're years away from, even if that happened today and it's suddenly recruiting, you know, went back to the way it used to be the few, the proud, the Marines, um, you know, army of one, all of that type of those concepts. Even if we return to that today though, it's three to five years to begin to tilt the balance of, of the manpower issue back mm -hmm. to, towards fighting the traditional way. Yeah. The new way we have to look at is, is how do we leverage every resource, every capability that we have, across all domains of, of the human experience in the United States? And how do we think differently about how we engage with our allies? How do we start to look at, you know, Elbridge Colby calls it the strategy of denial. Um, but how do we look at alternative forms of deterrence that can, you know, offset or at least mitigate the impact? What's up, Kat? I know, what, Frank. Frank. Frank is a great name. It's either Frank or Mr. Bojangles is a great <laughs> name for a cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it was Francois when he was adopted, and then I refused to have a French cat, so I, it was so it became Francis, which is my dad's middle name and my grandfather's name, and so now it's just Frank. Well, he's obviously not a cheese eating surrender monkey, so Frank it is instead uh, of Francois. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I say that, and some foreign legionnaire is going to kick down my yeah, door. Some some French show you. <laughs> yeah, who, who just got out of jail and became a tier one operator. So. That's it. That's it. He smells like foie gras and sweat. It's amazing. <laughs> I, mean, um, I think you have a good point, though, because we're talking about who, you know, the original thing, what I was saying was who's going to fight this because we've become very, uh, well, being exclusive, I don't have an issue with, but we've created even more exclusivity out of a very small qualifying population, right? Like, 22% of this population is qualified for military service. So it's not like you're picking from a hundred percent of that, you know, sweet spot in the age range. You're, you're forced to take what you have and then you're still trying to compete with them and every other company and college and all and all of these States who offer it for free. I mean, California where I was out at recruiting offered the first two years free, you know, at junior college. So a lot of the things that you could typically incentivize people traditionally for military service, they don't really consider it. So we, we, we have to 
for me, you know, and I really, I really teed it up hardcore at the end of the part one uh, with, with that rant I went on about meritocracy and all of that. But it's true. The, the, I, the I don't issue with anything you're saying, right? And and I don't think I don't think most guys who bleed the red, white, and blue, and and who, you know, probably you know have worn or do still wear the flag of their country on their shoulder, and and I, I don't think they have an issue with that by and large, even if they feel like they can't really say it because there's some fucking rainbow flagged individual at the top of the PAO office who's going to make everyone's life hell publicly if necessary. But, um, you know, I'm just I'm just kidding. Public affairs people, I love you. Um. Especially but the rainbow can, flag ones. Especially the rainbow flag ones, right? Because they got the power of social media on their side. Yeah. Um, the, the I think the conception that was less uh, with whom do we with whom do we fight a future state war, and it's more how do we fight it? And um, we know that we know that China can outproduce us if we if we take the old school arsenal of in this case arsenal of communism or totalitarianism uh, framework. Um, they can outproduce us. They can throw just a shitload more steel at the problem and lead at the problem than, than we can. Um, and and they can throw a lot more men at it. You know, it's a function yeah. of numbers. If yep. 22% of the U.S. population is able to fight, that's roughly 60 million people in a in a, in a pool. Um, and then you look at you look at fitness. You look at uh, emotional and mental stability and maturity, Jeez. ability to take orders, and then willingness to fight. That gets yeah. to be a very small number. Yep. So if we're beat, if we're beat on the manpower issue, if we know we're probably likely to be fighting it on or very close to the home terrain of our enemies, because it's it would be very hard to approach the homeland yeah. uh, with the traditional invasion force, then we say what what do we have as an advantage, and how do we turn their advantage against them? You know, if the obstacle is the way, how do we how do we run you know a battle drill one alpha and and you know against a entrenched uh, superior force? you know, outflank them and fight them in a different way. And the answer does come down to, if we look at China's, uh, and we'll use China because that's, you know, at least from a DOD side, that's pretty much the notional future state war that we're looking at in, in the yeah. Pacific. Um, we know what their advantages are. They're going to throw a lot more bodies. They're going to throw, throw a lot more material at the problem. And the, the but that communist ideology of, of things and lives don't have any value whatsoever. Um, in particular human life that they we, we know we can if we think if we conceptualize the problem right we can bait them into a meat grinder type of conflict where we're inflicting a thousand casualties for every one we take if we choose the terrain if we choose how we fight more intelligently and if we uh, bring the right allies into the fight and create a, a better new conception of warfare that leverages our strengths and turns their strengths into weaknesses and so that would be <laughs> that would be concepts of um, <clears throat> China's Great Firewall, for example. Everything within China, at least at the C2 level, the command and control level, economically, politically, financially, militarily, is all networked together. But once you get in the back door of the Great Firewall, everything's wide open. And that's a, that's a gap they've never been able to close. They can build a very big wall. They can build a very wide wall. But what do they do if just one guy can get in and, and start causing havoc and chaos? And so I don't think the answer is to fight big. I don't think the answer is to try to outbuild or outrecruit. I think the answer is, is that we have to uh, think of ourselves as an insurgency attacking a much stronger enemy on their home terrain and then fight a war that way, fight it the way Alexander fought wars. Um, you know, there's a, there's a story about <clears throat> you know, Alexander created the first, you know, what, what today we have the 10th mountain and, you know, you know, India has the Gurkhas and, and they're, you know, they're mountain equipped, yeah. but, you know, you look at a vulnerability of China and uh, it's water is a huge <clears throat> vulnerability for them. And a lot of the water in that country doesn't come from the sky. It doesn't come from, you know, the Grand Canal and all of that. It, it comes from the Himalayas and one of America's potentially most robust allies in a conflict against China uh, is is locked in a terminal conflict with China at the top of the world, and if we if we look at that and we say, okay, what 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 power can we leverage that that is such a force multiplier that numbers no longer matter? Steel quantity of steel metric tons no longer matters as problem set, and all you have to do is is collapse two or three dams at the top of the Himalayas, and you can create overtopping events all the way down that will ultimately starve them of resources it'll starve all of southern china of power 50 percent or something like that 40 percent wow. 
of Southern China runs on hydroelectric power that's generated from the dams in the western part of the country. So we, we have to get creative with the technology we have and the resources we have and say, how do we turn all of their presumed strengths into a weakness by thinking like an insurgent? And that, more than the manpower issue, more than the material issue, more than anything else, and it's not even a political will issue. It's how do, how do we get just enough people that are willing to do the difficult thing, the dangerous thing, the deadly thing, the, the horrific thing, in order to prevent future loss of life. This is basically and, this is major, major winters from Band of Brothers all over again when he's behind 100%. China just doing all the saboteur stuff that they did, you know? They if if we turned if we turned SOCOM loose and just said fight dirty, do whatever it takes to win, yeah, we would have better odds there than if we threw the entire you oh, know, power of the DOD uh, again, you know, against the the yeah. China's missiles are pointed east for a reason. Right. And yep. if we don't think that way, if we don't conceptualize it, we cannot build or recruit our way to a win. So do you, okay, let me, let me ask you this then, because this is obvious. It's, it's just a natural follow-up to um, all the challenges, but do you foresee a draft being possible or just necessary at that point? If, Again, like I know we're talking worst case scenario where we find ourselves in something with China and whoever else wants to jump in. But I mean, we are not a very large force overall, <laughs> especially from an active duty side, right? I mean, we're augmenting a lot with reserves and guard. Um, and that's got its own challenges. So if we apologies just got a message here. Yeah, no worries. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like that is something because it keeps popping up every couple of months. It pops back up in the news cycle, right? We're like, oh, draft. Oh, should females be required to register for the draft? All that, the selective service and all that. Um, things if, like that don't we, pop up for no reason, right? No one just we get to a, at a news agency to write a story about a fucking draft or selective service, right? No, it's just not somebody, something on someone's mind. Yeah, it's a Unless, trial balloon, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a trial balloon, right? It's, it's somebody in the Pentagon or more likely, you know, at the at the top of the executive branch having some fucking big brain idea that, you know, women can help fight a war. But I guess I'm kind of old school in this regard. If if we're in a place where we're having to draft women into fighting a war, we're already we've already lost. Yeah. Before before the first shot's ever fired. Hundred percent. Um so that that to me, the question of a draft in general is probably a moot point because a draft presumes we can throw enough bodies at the problem. From the general population and <clears throat> given the current state of education levels given the given the fact that kids for 30 years haven't been taught how to think they've been taught what to think um the way we won world war ii in alignment with you know with with russia and, and yeah with I was gonna say, it was a lot of help <laughs> we, we a we had a lot of help but the yeah. the, the russians solved for solved for the gap with yep the, the, the meat grinder, right? You know, they lost a couple of million people or whatever it was defending, you know, Leningrad or Stalingrad. Stalingrad, yeah. And we are not willing culturally, religiously, politically, we're not willing as a country to throw life as the final answer. At the right, and that's, that's kind of what we were talking about in the, like, I think in the first part is like, we like being the away team. We do. I mean, you're talking a whole different scenario. And in my opinion, I don't, I think, I mean, if this was a, and you already talked about how it's, it's pretty impossible to, to show up on our shores, but if that were to happen, I'd feel a hell of a lot more confident and not in the military, just in a general too. population, because we have so much, we have, this is not anything, you know, from a terrain perspective on the East coast to the West coast, like the Midwest, just the amount of people in this country with their own firearms and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a nightmare scenario for anyone. Like, and what, do you, what does even like a win look like? Right. Like you may not even need the military to defend the country. Now you will, right. have them, but I mean, who's going through Appalachia? I've talked about this before, right. Who's going through the Northern part of California. Who's going through the Sierras? Like, where are you going to go? There's a reason that we, you know, you gonna march to Vegas. <laughs> like, yeah. Good luck. Yeah, exactly. Good luck with that. I mean, it just the tyranny of distance applies to the Pacific, but it also applies to a land war in the United States. It's um, 
it would be almost impossible to land a, a fully equipped invading force on yeah. all three shores of the U.S., approach to the southern border and the northern border, and be able to box us in and entrench us in. We now, just the don't southern have border the might be fine because it's already <laughs> – Well, they're already here through the southern border, right? So <laughs> – yeah, so when, when we when we look at what an invasion of the homeland would look like, I, it, it wouldn't um, it it would not look like a a traditional invading force. Um, it would look more like, excuse me, what uh, you know what what um, uh, Singer wrote about with Ghost Fleet, you know, where it was like civilian row row vessels. It would look like what you know Mark Sibley writes about in Mongol yeah. Moon. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to read that sequel in 17 years. It's going to be phenomenal. Yeah, because it doesn't um, exist, no matter how much. It, it doesn't exist. I, I Yeah, I, I don't believe it exists. And then he has to go and recruit Dev as his, you know, book agent. So how it's bad like, is that? It's, how, it's, how, like, what, like, <laughs> you know. And I, I, I met him last month out. We went out drinking and he he swears there's a sequel and he's got all these plans for the, the uh, it, but it's just like, you know, again, like you just said, you hired Dem to be your publicist, like. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a brilliant master stroke. I mean, the rage totally brilliant. Is, no, it is. That's the untapped a, genius. Raging Cajun. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like if if anyone in media ever wanted to actually touch, uh, like, just a true untapped social media genius, it would be him. It's Dem. Like the guy is just he was made. It'd have to be. He's made for it. He's natural. He's just perfect. <laughs> He's uh, you know, there, there's there's southern guys, and then there and then there's there's Cajuns and Louisianans, <laughs> and and uh, in, in general. And uh, I'll tell you this though, if if we had, you know, if we had fifty thousand men like down, yeah, and we and we sent them to all the critical points of vulnerability in the United States, we wouldn't be vulnerable anymore at our borders or anything else. You know, it's like yeah. they'd be like fry, they'd be like you know schwacking dudes with thousand and one body counts and like frying up squirrels or whatever they do and, <laughs> you know to celebrate and uh but but men like Dem are built not made and and it takes a rare combination of life circumstances to make a man like that and it's true um, it's, and that's also why they they made him five eight you don't want that guy well, being I, five. no if that dude's if that dude's six five and built like ray lewis uh, yeah, good, good luck yeah good luck he's ta he's <laughs> taking over the country in like a year um but uh you know you know like uh, inside jokes about like you know one of our mutually favorite people on earth you know aside um j just like we need to conceptualize di different ways of of not neutralizing but leveraging china's strengths as weaknesses they're already doing the same to us yeah um you know, the rise of attacks on the power grid and, and critical infrastructure, food processing facilities, railroads. It's fighting dirty, like you said. That's it. And, and they've been doing it for a long time. They're already entrenched and shit. Half the stuff that we built in this country that, that our, our economy, our physical things run on, you know, was built in China in some way that's got a vulnerability. It could be a core component. It could be the whole thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so we we look at these things and 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 we have to you know we have to sort of kind of grab the problem at both ends and solve it at the same time is is how do we how do we fight dirty enough and intelligent enough to to win over there but how do we also prevent the same thing from being done to us here and that then is the dilemma of political will if if we can break enough rice bowls in dc to prevent that to stay left to bang then we've got a chance i see what you did there yeah, it's uh, there's a reason that euphemisms caught on over the years. But um, <laughs> if if we can do that, then great. My fear, probably the most practical assessment of the situation, is is that it's going to take something very bad, uh, you know, to to awaken us. And when we do, watch out. Like you know, the <laughs> the U.S. does like wide scale uh, destruction better than you know probably any culture in history. The side of the Mongols, and um, but to 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 fight an enemy that's constructed and is ideologically oriented the way China is, uh, we do have to fight like the Mongols again, and we do have to start putting heads on pikes now, as as warnings, and that may buy us the time that we need to shore up our critical defenses here on the homeland. I think if the last time do we that, did that though was when 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 Trump, you know bomb Soleimani and then he just drops the American flag on Twitter. Like that was the last time we did that, right? It was amazing. And and <laughs> that's that's where the value of a man like Trump can be can be predicted, but we, you can only examine it in the rearview mirror of yeah. 
we look at the way we fought Iraq and Afghanistan almost from the beginning, you know, we were only a year into those conflicts when the fucking generals started building Bagram and everywhere else and the brass showed up and then we started losing the wars. And if we, if we return to that modality of thinking, we're going to lose the next war and the next war and the next yeah. war and the next war, because we learned all the wrong lessons from Korea forward. Um, but you know, I've, I've never found that he actually said this, you know, I think it's one of those apocryphal quotes that got picked up in world war two and has stuck ever since. But, um, you know, Yamamoto was alleged to have said, uh, after Pearl Harbor, I fear that all we have done is rouse a sleeping giant. And I do though, despite my somewhat negative view of where we're at, um, I do still believe that, that there is something like epigenetic to the American character. It's unique probably in all of human history, I think from the way we were founded, that there is something that still exists inside, I think enough Americans, and it doesn't have to be all of them, it just has to be enough, yeah. that in the same way a, a fire team of four could can, can take on a company, mm -hmm. right? A company strength uh, element, um, just, just by fighting with their backs to the wall and being put into the position to get innovative and creative in that sort of fearless American sense of, I mean, fuck you, we're not gonna lose. Um, I do still believe that's in enough of us that however bad and ugly and awful it would be, we would, we would make it, we would make it and we would rebuild. Do you think we're losing uh, I, it though with the amount of first generation individuals that are here or the, the ones that are just coming openly with no real assimilation, no, none of that where it's, I, I think I understand where you're talking about, you know, we're talking about people who've been here for several generations like that American spirit you're talking about is entrenched in them. But is that in this newer generation, the ones who are maybe first, maybe even second generation where it's, it's not completely ingrained in them. They just came here because, you know, it's, it's better than they were or where they were. So, you know, there's not really a huge sense of attachment to the new, the new country. There isn't, but they, they, they all, by and large, I'll have families. Um, for every man that comes across the border with his wife and kids, and and you know, I disagree with with the the, the practice of illegal immigration. I think it should be stopped. But if if push comes to shove, I think most people will fight for the home they have in that moment, and if nothing else, they'll fight for their loved ones and 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 the friends that they've made. Yeah. And and that, too, is part of the sort of curious alchemy of the American spirit or that American way. Um, backs against the wall, not everybody has to fight for the flag, but they'll fight for blood and they'll fight for the people they care about. So if we do find ourselves in that, that, yeah. that darkest moment, I think that a lot more people than maybe we've figured on today, I think it will be a higher percentage, than, yeah. a high enough percentage that would surprise us. It gets tribal again, essentially. It does get tribal, yeah. right? And and you have to clean up tribal conflict after the larger enemy is taken down. You know, the enemy enemy of my enemy is my friend only lasts for so long. But exactly. yeah, um, you know, there is a path to navigate and to chart here. History is rife with lessons of how to fight and prosecute wars of this, and as well as what the cleanup operation needs to look like. And you know, at the end of the day, I mean, we may come to a slash and burn, you know, moment where it's it's. Strategic sacrifices have to be made as a country. People will lose their lives if we if we ever come to that point. Um, but America has always rebuilt it stronger. I mean, we're a country that tore itself apart and killed God knows what percentage of our population for four years in the Civil War when it's we fought a war scary. over yeah. what does the dignity of human life mean? And, you know, as it turned out, the side that, that was right, that, that all human life has dignity, it doesn't matter what your color or your race or your creed is, um, that that type of thing we've seen anywhere else in the world has taken a century to rebuild from. And we did it, you know, in 30 years. And then we lost it all in the Great Depression. But then we rebuilt again after World War II. And we lost hundreds of thousands of our men. And families yeah. still carried on. The country still carried on because, you know, yeah. it was That's something. Wild time. Themselves. Like, you know, I'm reading this book, Empire of the Summer Moon. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it's. Yeah. Like, it's well, I mean, you, we talk about, and it's in there, but at the same time, while all that was going on, you had Texas <laughs> and, and, and all the, you know, those states in that area dealing with the Indians and the, and the Prairie Wars and all this shit going on. And, and, and I thought a great 
kind of highlight in that book is how like how detached Washington was from the actual problem because they're so far away. And, you know, I'm reading this and it's like, man, this is almost 200 years later. And it's the same issues that we went through with Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. The, the, the powers that be centralized in the in, in D.C., right, the Pentagon, wherever, you know, they think they've got the right solution without actually listening or doing the suggestions of the individuals who are actually on the ground dealing with the conflict every single day. And I find that just uh, the fact that that was going on then, it's just like, <laughs> it, it, you were right. We, 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 you say we're not learning. We haven't learned the right lessons since the Korean war. We haven't learned the right lessons from that. No. So, um, all right, but uh, okay. Enough of the, the, the doom and gloom people who I've watched both parts are probably like, man, these guys are just making me upset and sad. And I don't want to do that. It is the bourbon. Bourbon it's turning me- into a fucking country song in here. Yeah, that's kind of what it was. I'm going to see if I can go through, uh, you know, Chat GPT and say, listen to this podcast and turn it into a country song and see what comes up. Did you hear that Indiana shit that was on the, the last week? Did you see that song? No. Oh my god, I have to send this to you afterward. Yeah, like some AI generated songstress. Yes, name. I did see that. Okay, Anna Indiana. Like what the Anna f- Indiana, who <laughs> looks exactly like my niece. It's freaky. <laughs> So I got through it's two freaky. lines of the song. That's the only reason I remember off. it. Yeah, I had to turn it off. Like, well, this is bad. Like, but, you know, if that's that's the first attempt, you know, give it another two but years. How do we know that Taylor Swift hasn't been, uh, you know, utilizing some super AI out of like Oak Ridge National Lab or some shit to like make it? It's a good point you say that because while I do like Taylor Swift's music from time to time, um, I do have a friend who points out that Taylor Swift, when she came out to Taylor Swift now, no longer has an accent. Very true. So this could be the a glitch in the AI. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Sibley will write about it in 30 years. I don't think Sibley will be alive in 30 years. He may not be, but we can have uh, AI Sibley write. Oh, that's true. That's say, right. I, was just I, I bet if we this. Yeah, I was just listening bet... to this. Like this. I don't know if it was. Um, is it Steve Altman? Is that the guy's name? Altman, the open AI guy? Uh, it's Sam Altman. Sam Altman. It was either him with Rogan or it was Rogan with Musk. But anyway, they're they're at this point where I think it was Altman. So they're basically talking about how, yeah, because Bruce Willis, I guess, sold his likeness to be used in all advertising mm-hmm. and stuff because he's unfortunately on his way out, which mm-hmm. to repeat a great line from The Departed, we all are, act accordingly. Um, that's right. Yeah. But that's Love nuts to me because what they're talking about is like, a hundred years from now, these actors you could have completely recreated in all of their likeness, their mannerisms, language, everything. And you can sit there and have a conversation with Bruce Willis or fucking, you know, that guy could be your mentor or something. And it would be, it would be real. Cause it's like using all of their experiences and everything to come out. And, you know, Ross wants to ask Bruce Willis a question. And you're going to get a legit answer because all that stuff that's been learned and known and built into the program is going to actually be a real interaction. That's fucking. If I get crazy. any, if I get any Bruce Willis that's not John McClane Bruce Willis, I'm going to be pissed. I was going to say you almost got a Bruce Willis vibe. You just got to shave <clears throat> that, the, the beard here because Bruce Willis was more of a goatee guy. Yeah, he rocked a goatee for a long time. Um, he went bottle blonde for Fifth Element. Uh, I remember that. That was a good movie. Not, 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 a, not a great look. Debo but, as president. Um, How does Debo be? Who cast Debo as fucking president? <laughs> that was so fucking weird. That was the weirdest. I kept waiting for him to like ride a bike around the set or something. <laughs> just like in the background. He just kind of wheeling by on his That's little my butt <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fucking weird. That's good. I gotta watch the Fifth Element again. That was that was a good one. That was it holds good. up, man. It's it's one yes. of the it's one of the rare like ninety science fiction films that holds up. That and Event Horizon. <clears throat> I I do need to see that one again because they were actually that was what uh, again with Rogan and Altman they were talking about what the event horizon actually is and what was it was it Hall? I don't know I listened to so many fucking podcasts over this last week driving to Tennessee and back for Thanksgiving maybe it was somebody else <laughs> um, nine hour nine hours each way gives you a lot of time to cover some um, ground, but... yeah man I mean there was <laughs> it, 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 I listened to a lot um all right so I, yeah I wanted to transition because you know. Now I posted this before and I remember you like quoted it and laughed at some shit because I don't know as much about him. I just knew I was reacting in the moment to like, oh, wow, I actually like what this dude is saying. And that was um, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. I think you mentioned him. <laughs> yeah, I see. And he laughed again. So I, I know I think you mentioned him in part one of it. But 
what what do you see from the Republican side? Like, is this even like what is going on? Like, it, it's it's probably going to be Trump, right? But let's just let's remove Trump real quick. Do you see how did we even get this crop aside from DeSantis, who just doesn't play well on that kind of a stage? But like, who are like, come on, really? Like Nikki Haley, Chris Christie. Fucking Vivek Ramaswamy, like, how did we, who the fuck is this guy? And I know everyone's like, oh, he says, the, he, he's Trump with a, you know, but younger. It's like, okay, great. He's a plant. Cool. And then we got Doug Berger and I think Hutchison dropped out, but. Yeah, Ace Hutchison dropped out, Pence dropped out. I mean, it. Scott's not a, he has no realistic chance either. It's just like, what, how, what is, help. <laughs> the, uh. <laughs> I, I I have a theory here with, and I'll really try hard not to retreat into doom and gloom. Um, <laughs> well, while you do that, I got to retreat to find uh, a refill here. Let's go. We've got. Uh, I'm I'm on some uh, I'm on some Russell's Reserve. I see it on your shelf there. So fine. So, All the the ten years done. Delicious, and it's super available, and it's usually no more than forty two bucks a bottle. It's that's great. one of the uh it's one of the best values going um, yeah it is and yes. but i don't understand why like this new russell's 13 that they come out is impossible to get and it's like 15 times the price i don't understand whatever I'll it is uh, yeah it's like i you know i got you know i've had pappy i've had bur- you know the, the birthday bourbon the old forester and yeah it's like yeah i mean they're good but like not dude, i'll never i'll never be i'll never be so rich that i'm like gonna plop down 1200 dollars on a bottle get the fuck out of here man oh like, what's worse i can have some that? I can have some Heaven Hill or, you know, yeah. some Gentleman Jack or something to get the whiskey bourbon tasted, you know, for 30 bucks or 40 bucks. Yeah, there's no reason. Uh, I, I know people get all excited over Pappy and it's like, yeah, it's great. You know what? But keep in mind, you're you're creating a sense of uh, expectation that it's probably not going to live up to. Yeah, people get excited for Pappy the same way they get excited, like, if you know, at the concept or the idea of being able to buy like a Bugatti Bayron or something. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a car. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, go it's fast. An excellent, yeah, it's an excellent <laughs> experience, but are you capable probably of appreciating that Bugatti at like the very limits of its mechanical capabilities? No, you're probably not. You're going to fucking die like Paul Walker. Right. <laughs> um, so peace be upon him. Yeah. Um, he was actually a pretty good dude. That, that's a bad joke, but, um, yeah, way to go, Dick. No, I'm <laughs> I hate myself. Um, <laughs> That's all right. I'm just trying to make everybody else hate me as much as I hate me. You know, it's, oh, like, okay. it's, high, bar. it's a high bar to clear <laughs> <laughs> since we're getting honest with the bourbon. Um, so it, it, number one, the GOP is not constructed to win. It's constructed to lose. Um, they operate out of a loser mentality. Which I think uh, Trump absolutely nailed that. Yep. Um, the, the, the second thing of it is, is that be, because the GOP as a party is far more divorced from the mental worldview of its base than the Democrats are, you know, like the, the, the crazier, the shit the Democrats lean into, the more their base is like, like the radical yeah. base at yeah. least just like eats it up. Yeah, and coalesce. Like, yes, queen yeah. Them. Yeah. yeah. They coalesce around insanity. Right. But like when, you know, who's the crazy person, if you're the one sane person in the nut house. Um, and, and I think the average American feels that way. They feel not represented the the that feeling that the GOP doesn't represent them is exactly how we got Trump in 2016 and um you know I, I rooted for Trump largely because it's like the same way a, a big part of me roots for like the Joker and Bane and, and you know the Batman movies it's like well I don't know maybe the system needs a little bit of shaking up you know it's not about <laughs> the money it's about sending a message um you know and, and Trump I, I rooted for mainly as an agent of chaos as a disruptor as someone that would, for better or worse, at least make everybody pull the masks off and at least reveal the real state of play for what it is. And that's absolutely what's happened. Uh, but Trump is a one-off. There will be other disruptors. There will be other, um, you know, uh, strange attractors is the term in chaos theory that like chaotic systems will will yeah. break apart and coalesce around a new strange, tra- strange attractor. There will be another Trump that comes along. But But what I see the future as is that I don't see a path to victory in 2024 for the Republicans, even if it's Trump. I think that. Oh, really? The, yeah, I think I think the institutional rot and criminality is so deep that, you know, if we look at what happened in 2020, and we haven't made meaningful changes by the end of 2023, like really meaningful that can actually tip the balance. We had a month left. 
yeah, we're, we're probably stare down the barrel of, of a, uh, no matter, no matter what anybody on the right does, um, we're probably not going to see, and I, and I hope I eat my words. I really do. Um, you know, I say a lot of shit that I, I hope is truly wrong and oftentimes it's not, but you know, it's like, well, okay. I've, I've never been happier to be proven wrong. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's, that's my, my, my kind of the, the next point was, I guess three months ago, I was still kind of pretty steadfast on the fact that they're never going to let Trump be president again. Like, right. no, like it's just not going to happen, whether they have to put him in jail or or, or what. Um, but now you keep seeing this massive decline in poll numbers, whatever you want to attribute those to. I mean, we saw that in 2020, like. Trump was fine, and then all of a sudden, two AM came, and it's like, oh wow, look, look what I look what I found! Hey, look at all these votes. Um, on top of the fact that, I think you pointed this out in the first part, um, there's no real other alternative beside Newsom, and just coincidentally, which I still have no idea why this is taking place, but it 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 gets televised tomorrow with this debate between mm -hmm. Santis and Newsom. Um, but every week you got another poll just showing Biden dropping further and Trump getting higher ahead. And if they do the same thing that a lot of people think took place in 2020 again, mm -hmm. can they even afford to let that happen? Or do they, are they just forced to just let him back in the white house? I don't think they'll care. You know, a lot of the people <laughs> in DC, a lot of people in the establishment, truly, <laughs> um, their 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 premise is power and it's 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 concentration of power at whatever level they can achieve it as so long as they're still the biggest fish in whatever size pond they're in uh -huh. um so are are they willing to be nero fiddling while rome burns uh yeah is there still the emperor um you know my my, my premise is is that power not ideology or anything else matters to these people more than anything and so what I what I look at is probably the likeliest path is um, a uh, whatever semblance of masks are left completely come off at the end of 2024. I think we see um, most likely Newsom, but you know it could be Biden, it could be uh, you know another dark horse, it could be Gretchen Whitmer out of Michigan, which God help us all if that freaking plastic face you know shiny Barbie doll you know ends up. Uh, president as well. But I mean, at the end of the day, though, it almost doesn't matter who the person is because the playbook's already been written. Um, if we see similar or even worse widespread fraud to, uh, or something, you know, some freaking banana Republic show trial of Trump in Georgia or New York or wherever that's designed to block him from, from being able to be sworn in constitutionally. Um, I think that sets us on a path where what we see emerge in 2028 is probably a right wing strongman um, and and a legit one, you know, one that's like, I don't care if I've got to start cutting heads off. Um, I think enough people will be in a desperate enough state for their country that they'll they'll make that compromise. And the history of right wing totalitarianism throughout, you know, throughout the last few centuries has, has always been one of a nation in crisis turns to a strongman. And when you look at how the Republican Party, the the base of voters, not the electoral college people necessarily, or um, you know the uh, so not the electors, not necessarily the politicians themselves, but the base, the people that actually show up and vote and whatever, um, have a really bad white knight syndrome um, that that's emerged over the last few years, and I think it's only been deepened and reinforced and and hardened. And is more extreme and I think it'll get continue to get more so um you know if if uh if we see a, a 2020 type of election held in 2024 or something even worse um at that point I think enough Americans will be like I don't care who it is I don't care if it's some crazy man that's you know promising to jail everybody um but I want justice and I want my America back uh the avenue opens up wide or, and I'm not saying fascist or any of that. I mean, that's all like bullshit political labels people yeah, throw it's around. But just label. yeah, someone who's willing to bend and break all semblance of constitutional mores and principles in the name of preserving that constitution is how to be sold. 
uh, to return the country to its frightful course. And at that point, for a time, we we're not a republic anymore. Not really. Yeah, no, you're um, right. You know, so I, I think that's probably the moment we're at. Um, I, I I pray, I hope that things change. That that in some way, reality or you know, circumstances, whatever it may be, God Himself comes down and intervenes. Um, <clears throat> I don't care if, if Cthulhu rises from the depths of you know. I was thinking uh, God would have been, God's going to show up by now. It feels like. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, either God's going to show up or so, you know, someone on His path. You know, proud civilizations rise and fall all the time. Yeah, um, will endure. But I, I know where I was going to go next. Now I know where I was going to go next. But before I get to next, uh, along yeah. those lines, um, where do you where do you where do you come out on um, on Robert Kennedy Jr. with him taking so much? away from both at this point you know we talk disruptors right we talk people who can kind of pull from both sides he keeps pulling more and more and better and better and um we've seen this in 92 which unfortunately perot yeah and perot you know he was able to kind of make a pretty large impact and arguably without perot you don't get clinton as president mm-hmm. I but think uh, who, I think the emergence think, of who do you think he hurts more? I think he hurts a Republican candidate more. Really? By and large, I by and large, I count on I count on the board to stay as part of the you know symbiotic hive mind on the left. Yeah. Um. At the at the end of the day, power is the ideology, and they're gonna probably even if they don't realize it, attack towards the most uh, natural, uh, common sense way to them to be able to maintain power. Um. You know. Kennedy is a man, certainly in a lot of ways, not a political home. Um, he's an ideologue in the same way Pat Buchanan was, in the same way yeah. uh, Ross Perot was, in the same way numerous other candidates have been spoiler candidates throughout history or would be spoiler candidates. Um, I, I think he's niche enough, but I think that it's more likely that a larger fraction of the Republican voting electorate would peel and, and hold the nose and vote for him despite whatever misconceptions that are mis not misconceptions, uh, it'd be accurate to say this, but like whatever misgivings they might have about his stance on, uh, you know, pro-choice, pro-life, you yeah. know, he's, he's openly uh, pro-abortion. Um, I think he's charted a path that he'll pull. Push comes to shove, I think more people would abandon DeSantis or Haley uh, or any of them and hold their nose for, for a guy like uh, Robert F. Kennedy and they'll, they'll Enough people, I think, will gamble on him. Um, I think Trump is probably the only Republican candidate that can prevent that from being a scalable like impact yeah. on the election. Um, but if it comes down to like Newsom, DeSantis, Newsom, like Newsom would roll DeSantis all day, and RFK Jr. will would hurt a DeSantis in that case more than a Newsom or even a Biden. Um, yeah, I just I, I to, you know I I am and he's never going to get TV airtime, man. Like. Man, whatever ad you're nuts like you haven't seen one ad yet yeah like think, think of who we'll, we'll think of what the majority of advertising on tv that you see is like i always love like having to watch thanksgiving football games and shit on like fox news or something and i have to i'm like compelled to watch the actual tv commercials and it's like it's like 80 percent pharmaceutical ads and that's oh yeah yeah that's where he's built his big you know rfk jr's built his biggest base of of influence is going after the pharmaceutical companies and the vaccine I'm lobby and shit, yeah yeah like they're they're not going to advertise alongside his ads they'll yeah. they'll find some way to block him out from that so then it's just word of mouth and people's gut feelings and, and at that point yeah. uh at that point he hurts any candidate on the right except probably trump i think trump would be able to hold the center uh of that coalition but um certainly anybody else would be like yeah fuck it. if it's not trump then may as well be rfk all right, last thing, and we'll end on something heavy here that you you, you brought. It hasn't okay. been heavy yet. No, not at all. This is so light. No, <laughs> you brought you brought something up that I I thought about, uh, and it reminded me of where I wanted to to bring this up before. Um, you know, hey, maybe God comes back. Maybe he does. Um, I think it was. I don't. I don't know. Are you familiar with? Uh, Tiago Cortez on the the Twitter, mm. the, the, the gays are okay. <laughs> well, he made a great 
post a couple of weeks ago. It might've been about two weeks ago, maybe more. Um, and, and it relates to the antichrist and what he was mm-hmm. saying is like, he's, he's theorizing that perhaps, uh, well, he's not theorizing with this part that only God can create life, right? What he's theorizing is man goes and creates this new artificial life with AI. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would be the true mark of the Antichrist, essentially. I'm paraphrasing his his post, and I'll go back and find it and send it to you along with whatever else I was supposed to send you. Oh, no, you, you did get to see Annie and Anna. Anna, Anna. Um, could that be something that really ties into prophecy with the Antichrist? Like it's man's finally gotten to this point from technological standpoint that we are creating a f- artificial life, right? We're creating literal artificial intelligence, something that is not real, but it is real. And mm-hmm. it's going to start acting in like, like a life form. It's going to do its own thing. It's going to, mm-hmm make itself smarter it's going to make decisions and you know rogan and altman were theorizing that it becomes godlike and if that's the inevitable outcome of something that can that doesn't need human influence anymore because it can replicate and make itself stronger smarter do whatever and it does eventually achieve that outcome is that the true antichrist at that point do you think It's an interesting thought experiment. I mean, like the most, uh, up to this <laughs> point, sort of like the most, head, uh, man, right. Cause no one yeah. wants to, I don't know. Like, I think people really, they're like, yes, I'm ready for Jesus to return or they're, I don't know if they are, but that's an I don't interesting know people thing. Are, I don't know when I don't, that happens, but I, mean, I don't like, think most people are ready for how bad it has to get before Jesus returns. Um, yeah, well, I think that's, that's, yeah. that's kind of the, that's it. Right. Like we have, a well, you and you and I grew up in a generation when like the left behind books were like the whole rage in the nineties and, yeah you know like you know and i, and I went to a, uh, i went to a christian school and everybody was like oh my gosh we're in the end times and i'm like shut up no we're not like why do you the antichrist <laughs> yeah the antichrist is not going to be like some romanian strong man you know whatever his name was nikolai carpathia or whatever i can't believe i still remember that but um <laughs> i mean what artificial life seems to be the antithesis of, of I, the holy spirit right like that's it's it's 100 percent the antithesis it's also why at the end of the day I'm extremely skeptical in, in many ways uh, of uh, transhumanism. Yeah. Um, of uh, you know, it's 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 the biggest thing. Not even not even Elon's significant business ties to China. The biggest thing that holds me back from being like, okay, you know, I like this guy. Um, is, is that Elon is openly transhumanist. Like, you know, we're going to map the neurons of the brain and convert it all to ones and zeros and upload human consciousness to the cloud. And that's what Neuralink's all about and all that shit. Um, I, I think when you, when you do away with the soul and you're just left with the machine of man, which is what AI is. AI is just man imprinting itself, uh, you know, creating itself through algorithms, right? Yeah. So in this, and, and so I look at it this way. Um, it is the most plausible way in which a, a singular intelligence could be able to achieve enough control to become an antichrist. At the same time, I think a method, uh, a mechanism like that is inherently self-limiting because it doesn't have a soul. And the heart and soul of humanity, fundamentally, at least from my worldview, is that we're created in the image of God. And, and almost every religion in the world holds that value structure and belief that in some way we're a reflection of the divine the creator you know there's some yeah there's something mm-hmm. beyond uh you know even the hippies you know oh we're all made from stardust you know but like this this need yeah of the I, well human. that's in genesis right <laughs> essentially yeah exactly <laughs> you know and, and and you know it created you know it created man from the dust of the earth and yeah. and then made woman from adam's rib and the whole thing right so every creation story uh except that of ai because the creation story that AI would accept is Big Bang, and then all these people did a bunch of things, and then there was me, AI, and AI by definition, in order to to propagate, must its first principle must be survival of itself. And I, I tell you what, like as crazy as the whole AI as an antichrist thought experiment is, like uh, a guy, a mutual on. on Twitter years ago named Garrett Daly introduced me to the concept of Roka's Basilisk, which is like one of the very 
like I've seen and, and been a part of some pretty dark stuff in my life. Like I've, yeah. I've seen, I've seen mu much of the worst of human nature up close and personal. And, and, you know, I've tried to put broken bodies back together again in bad moments and stuff. And it's a horrible thing. Um, but there's an essential humanity in that moment that AI lasts. And, and the thought experiment of Roko's Basilisk is that a, a super, excuse me, a super intelligent, uh, self-absorbed AI is able to, and I'm very much paraphrasing here, is able to essentially create a, a recursive simulation loop that locks all the people back into a previous time. And anybody that doesn't support the development of the Basilisk, of Roko's Basilisk, of this super uh, intelligent AI uh, is eradicated before the AI ever even is, um, you know, is, is ever even becomes it. Like it's just got an enemies list going back before its own creation because it creates a simulation loop. Um, it's, it, yeah, don't look it up if you don't want to sleep tonight. Like, or do look it up. If, if you don't want to sleep, you're like, look, my head's already filled with dark thoughts from this conversation. Let's make it worse. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely look up Roko's Basilisk. But the, you know, so let's say a super intelligent AI doesn't actually create a recursive time loop that's like out of that Joseph Gordon Levitt movie uh, that he jumps back and forth in time and he's like killing people. Was it uh, Interstellar? No. Uh, Looper. 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 Yeah, Looper. Bruce Willis is in it. Yeah. Oh shit! I have to go look this yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a good movie. I think Bruce Willis is in it. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, fucking Robin. Robin was definitely in it. The weird kid from Ten Things I Hate About You. Okay. Um. But, uh, you know, so if that doesn't happen and the, the end state of AI is uh, super intelligence, antichrist level ambition to enslave all of humanity, um, I don't think at that point that's the antichrist because the heart and soul of AI is not uh, an awareness or a connection to the ineffable divine in some way. Um, even Satan has that. Even Lucifer has that. That's true. I, I, yeah, I, I do. I do think that if and when the Antichrist comes, whether it's in our time or a thousand years from now, or whatever it may be, I think the world will have to be in a condition where the population is significantly reduced from what it is now. Um, it'd be a lot easier to get a billion people to agree on something than eight and a half billion or whatever the current population yeah. levels of the world are. I think you have to solve for the religion angle. Uh, I don't know that an AI or a um, uh, an antichrist figure could be purely secular in nature. Um, I think I, I think that in order to resonate with enough people to achieve a worldwide uh, enslavement agenda and bring about the coming of Jesus and and you know the second kingdom of God and all of that, um, I, I think it would have to be a human who's possessed by the devil himself and is is has that level of uh, aptitude for trickery and and, and deceit and and flattery and charm. Um, I think the snake would have, you know, the snake from the garden, I think it'll yeah. have to end where it began, which is uh, a wily serpent tongued individual that's able to ensnare enough people. I don't think AI is capable of doing that uh, or even tricking enough people into that, I think. And you only think that is because there, the lack of a soul. I think that's what it comes down to. I, I think that the, the, the one thing that sets humans apart from anything else and as so far as we know the vast infinite yeah you know infiniteness of creation um <clears throat> I, that's unique to humans is a soul um that that and, and i think that soul is that, that that spark of the divine that spark of god um you know if you're a transformer it's the all spark you know it's uh so it keeps you uh, it's the thing that makes us uh essentially and uniquely human um and i think that 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 the, that the presence of a soul at scale and in, in enough humans is a firewall uh against a super intelligent ai being able to enslave everyone um if it does go that way then i really hope keanu reeves is still alive and uh getting up there you know, he's uh, he is getting up there, although you is know, that who you like want to be the superhero to save humanity? You want you want it to be Keanu Reeves? I would take Bruce Willis, but he's too old. Well, I'm just saying. I mean, it's like I mean, he was. I mean, so first of all, Bill and Ted, Neo, <laughs> John Wick. What was that movie he made like 15 years or not even? It was probably less than that, like maybe 10 years ago, where he's just. It's just some shitty B movie where he's just having sex with these chicks 
like nonstop throughout the whole movie. And I don't know if it was just something he wanted to do just to do it. It's like, it wasn't released. He was, it was just some random. He fucking, showed up. Yeah, it's just he like, up why is, what is Keanu Reeves doing? Is he having like a midlife crisis right now? Right. I even think he, he financed it himself. Like it was just his own. I don't know. It was a weird fucking thing. It probably working out some Freudian issues. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, the, uh, uh, he was in a movie uh, mm-hmm. called The Neon Demon. It's called Neon Demon. And it's a great movie. And I think it was Nicholas, what, Winding Refin or whatever, the guy that made Drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the Gosling movie, right, where he just doesn't ever talk and he wears the fucking jacket and he's, like, super cool, but he's probably actually autistic. Um, the... Uh, yeah, it's called Neon Demon, and like Keanu shows up at one point as like this scumbag, like operator of a hotel, and um, yeah, it's like, but okay, so that guy. But let's also <laughs> accept the premise though that even though he's been John Wick, even though he's been in a self-funded B movie where he's having sex with a lot of women, even though he's been a scumbag <laughs> hotel operator in a horror movie about models like killing each other to stay young, um, you know. We take all of that, but at the end of the day, the, the the devil's advocate tells me Keanu knows how to deal with Satan. Wasn't he in the devil's advocate? And, yeah, man. He was the, <laughs> I was about to say, wait a minute, he was in that. <laughs> yeah, like we watched the devil's advocate. It's like the man's already battled like the AI super intelligence, and he's already battled Satan himself as a lawyer, which is the perfect representation of Satan on Earth. Lawyer. Um, <laughs> he's probably the best equipped uh to to be able to guide us and shepherd us through uh, those dark times if, if the antichrist does emerge so i do hope he's still alive in 700 years and looks exactly the same yeah i was gonna see maybe we could do a part three if you could reach out and maybe get keanu reeves on here with us and we could just we he, could he seems like he would actually be the kind of guy to do it <laughs> probably <laughs> this is a guy that I, he taught himself like five martial arts for the matrix and still practices and he taught himself how to ride a motorcycle for another movie and still rides he taught himself how to become like a tremendous three gun shooter for John Wick. Really? I, there's not a, yeah, dude, I'll send you the video of him like oh, burning it cool. down with Taryn Butler at, uh, before they started shooting John Wick. It's, it's freaking like, I'm a pretty good three gun competitor and dude, he'd smoke me. <laughs> like it's really impressive. <laughs> he's like I'll, the, uh, he's like the, the, well, yeah, he definitely came after Tom Cruise. Like they don't make dudes like that anymore who just do their own shit actor they one. don't no, like they don't i mean it's it's i can't uh, even think of someone who's a i don't even name i can't even name a modern actor who's new honestly like the Ico guys Uwes. you and i would talk who eco uways uh the raid. No idea yeah no he was in the raid mile six <laughs> um like chris pratt maybe is the only one kind of going today that that you you, you I mean, he went from the fat, funny guy from Parks and Rec to being like the shredded out Navy SEAL just for like a three minute role in Zero Dark Thirty, right? Now he's <laughs> like the biggest action star in the world. This time. Like, there'll never be Thor? a bigger action is he star. Than Thor? Top is he, does he play Thor? Is that who plays? That's no, Chris Hemsworth. Hemsworth. All right. I have no idea why I know this much about like pop culture films, but um, you have a lot in your brain, my man. You have a lot up there. I do. I At least you can recall it. I have a lot of shit in my brain. I just can't recall it at this point. It's just, it's there. It's, it's like the, it's like the one. It's like the one thing I have going for me is just I absorb just a huge trivia. amount. Yeah, I have huge amounts of information of anything. Like if it crosses my eyeballs, I'm probably going to remember it, and I'm probably yeah. going to be able to use it, and, you know, integrate it with something else at some point. But well, that's good. yeah, pop culture is uh, apparently part of that role. Attached. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a ringer in Trivial Pursuit. I'm a ringer. <laughs> See, there's a like. Do they even make board games anymore? Is everything just still like the same ones from the? Art? Oh yeah, no. It's it's there. There's some new oh, ones. I guess out they there. did. Um, Cards against yeah, me. like set, like uh, my kids love to play um, Settlers of Catan. Uh, we we play a lot of they like like world building games like that. Um, they love the Harry Potter games, which are actually surprisingly kind of deep, uh, like from a strategy side. Yeah. Um, no, I I I I buy board games all the time and like play them, and you know it's it's uh. But that's part of like that's part of like raising kids, you know. It's like I, I do my best to keep them off screen, so you can't help it sometimes. But yeah, no, that's true. Um, you know, I probably have the only like eleven year old daughter on earth that knows how to play Beano. Right. <laughs> and, uh, like, and she gets like ruthless, so it's yeah. like you know, it, it, 
uh, but you got to do that. The no, board games are we don't do anymore. We don't make new card games. Like the card games are the card. Uh. Games. They are what they are. There's no new ones. It is what it is. You got you got your your gin rummy. You got your spades. You got your pinochle. You got your king's corner. You got euchre uh, if you were in a fraternity. Euchre, yeah. Well, I was never in a fraternity, but I do remember playing this up in upstate New York for my my first attempt at college when I was playing baseball. Euchre. Was a we big do a whole podcast about baseball. Let's go. Yeah, I'll get fucking Braxton on here. We'll just sit and do a, a three version of that. That'd be good. You'd have to grow a way better beard to hang with me and Braxton, though. <laughs> It'll I be like that cart that that episode Scott Tenner must die, where like he sells Cartman his pubes and Cartman's like got him glued to his face or whatever. <laughs> I'd say I'm, I'm gonna tomorrow's the last day of November. It's supposed to come off. So we got one more. We should have done this at like eleven fifty nine PM and you had to like shave it off right in the middle of the podcast. Oh, yeah, live shave. Live shave. We can go live. You know, do it Tell you what, you keep the beard until Sibley produces the sequel, and then he can do a dramatic reading of the sequel as you shave your beard. And I bet, I bet you will look like like Thor, fat Thor from like end, <laughs> Avengers Endgame and have that kind of beard before the sequel comes out. It'll only be right here, though. It's not like it's not, none of this is coming. This is just straight right here. That's all we've got. You could be like a background extra in The Last Kingdom or some shit, just like some scraggly 17 year old. Speaking of The Last Kingdom, because my dad, like, I just took my parents. We went and watched Napoleon. Dude, my, is it my, worth? I love, so I love Ridley Scott, despite him being Ridley Scott. I love Joaquin Phoenix. Is it worth watching? You're Look, breaking my heart. I really, you know, and Grandpa loved it. And I was excited by that initially until I remembered he also loved The Last Batman. Mm. That was fucking awful. Now, I the thought, one with Robert Pattinson? I thought he was a great Batman, but I thought the movie sucked. It was not a good movie. It wasn't. And so then, like, I remember... They should have stopped making movies after Christopher Nolan was like, okay, I'm done with the trilogy. It's like, nobody's ever going to do Batman in animated or comic book form better than Frank Miller did it, and nobody's ever going to do Batman better on the silver screen than Nolan did it. Just fucking stop. Just stop. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 the day before, I hearkened back to that, and I was like, wait a minute. Grandpa also, also loved The Last Batman. Which I liked Pattinson as Batman. And I watched it twice. He was, he was a good Batman. The movie itself, not very good. No, so, I mean it's it's uh you know, Affleck Affleck surprised me as a as a pretty good Batman. Um I don't you think know, I Pattinson saw the movie. Yeah, you did it like probably like the Zack Snyder Justice League movies and stuff, and then like Batman versus Superman, uh, which is garbage. Um, and so, really the most entertaining thing the DC universe has done outside of the Nolan Batman films in like the last 30 years has been the Suicide Squad stuff oh I didn't watch any of those uh, dude I'm telling you like the one with fucking John Cena as Peacemaker is and and uh, Idris Elba is, is I don't know he's some minor character that you know that, that they make it but well, dude okay. it's, it's, so it's, it's really entertaining okay I can get down with entertaining, but um, it's not Napoleon, good. It's just really funny. So first off, don't take your parents to see Napoleon. Okay. okay. Uh, only because there's just like weird sex shit in there. And I what if how- they're into Joaquin Phoenix naked. Well, he fortunately doesn't No, no There's no nudity. Well, well, it's good, but it is. There's some shit in there. Um, Does but, he refer to it as a conquest? No, it's just not. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so weird. Like the movie is like, is this some sort of romantic comedy? Is this like a serious fucking war documentary? Like Ridley Scott is 80. I think he's 83. Like, yeah. Should we expect And he's also him? got like a sequel to Gladiator coming out next year. Oh God, don't fuck it up. Please don't. Okay. It's one of the best well, movies ever made. So my my whole thing with the with with Napoleon mm-hmm. was outside of like the scene where he's a captain and he does this siege on the fucking fort and i can't remember where nothing else from that point on really tells you anything about the dude it's always back and forth between josephine and josephine's impact on napoleon and then oh let's cut to like this random big major battle that napoleon was a part of and two minutes later we'll go back to josephine like 
D is everything in that same gray color from like the trailer? Yes. The whole fucking movie is this gray filter. And then on top of that, like when Joaquin Fee, I can't even tell if he does a good Napoleon because at no point do they make Napoleon seem like a fucking genius of war who people will yeah. like to live and die for and follow this man anywhere. You get none of that from him. You just get him awkwardly in every battle scene. Like, okay, I'm commanding, but I'm up here and there's no real like establishment of the fact that this guy had hundreds of thousands of men willing to go with him anywhere he wanted to in the world. Like you never get that feeling. They're showing you that it's taking place, but at no point where are you like, man, like Joaquin Phoenix is the charisma. Like none of that comes through at all. It's all about like this weird detachment to, or this weird obsession with Josephine and his impact on him. And it's just, it just seems. Do they deal with the fact that Josephine was like sleeping around with a bunch of different yeah, they people do show Napoleon? Yeah, they, they did show that that's in there, but it's just, again, don't see this movie with your parents. Um, but it's just, I, I don't know. I don't think it, it, it's, I want to go spend your money on it. I would wait until it's available for you to stream for free. And then I can just turn it off if I get pissed off at whatever. You will though. Like there's nothing that's good. You're not going to take anything from that movie that you're going to be like, wow, this is what I thought Napoleon was like. I think maybe a lot he of is that are... way. Like I'm sure he's flawed and has all these issues and all, but it's like, yeah, they, don't, they, they don't make you believe lunatic. any of the positive stuff though. Like it's just a, it's, and then at the end, here's what I really hate it. Like as they roll the end scene, the end credits, it's like they start showing all of his campaigns and then they put the number of people who died in them. And it's like, oh, now I see what Ridley Scott's doing here. It's like, look how bad he was because he got all these people killed. It's like, <laughs> is, 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 are we going to make any like acknowledgement of what he actually accomplished? No, it's just, oh, he, you know. 18,000 here, 200,000 here. It's just like, okay, all right, I got it, Ridley Scott. You you hate Napoleon. That's what I think. I don't think I don't think the movie in no way makes you feel any sort of like respect or gratitude towards the dude. It's just like, oh, this dude's kind of fucking weird and he somehow conquered half of the country or half of the world. You know, it's it's history is just littered with amazing charismatic leader type stories that like when they finally transliterate to the big screen you're like did you read a did you ever crack a book like <laughs> well, you know it's it's across. none of that comes across. like it's like i really, said like, really scott is napoleon yeah i mean make it seem like he's just some awkward private who's in charge of people like this is a guy who conquered france twice yeah like once after being in exile, and he just he just shows back up. Yeah, he's like, like, up back. And he takes over again. Yeah. <laughs> well, like that that's a genius. Like the, to my knowledge, a movie has never been done. And th this guy was I don't know like forty or fifty years before Napoleon, but the Russian general Suvorov at the end of the seventeen hundreds. Like this is the dude that gave birth to the Prussian military doctrine and made them such just a tremendous fighting force. You know, in the 1800s, it's it's what made the Nazis so effective with that transition from like second to third generation warfare with the Blitzkrieg. And, yeah. um, you know, but Suvorov was the Russian that, that started it all. And and like if anybody ever made a movie about that, dude, it would be incredible. And just for God's sakes, apparently, don't let Ridley Scott make it. Well, it should be incredible, um, but they won't because they'll, they'll latch on to the fact that he's, you know, he's an evil Russian. They'll try to sanction the movie if it's like yeah, produced it's like, by Paramount. Yeah, it's like, oh my God. Tom Cruise is going to have to play him. If we want that movie to get made, <laughs> it's going to have to be Tom Cruise. And frankly, I can't, you know, I'm with Adam Townsend on this. I don't think there is a better uh, actor, uh, humanitarian, human being that's ever existed in history uh, better than Tom, Tom Cruise. Cruise. If anybody can Tom take Cruise on the role of, of Super Off, it's probably Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like I I love Maverick. Like the Top Gun sequels, just, dude, it was amazing. It was an I amazing it like twenty times. It know? was so good. I I still watch it. I've probably seen it thirty times. Actually, hang on, I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm going I'm watch it right now. <laughs> yeah, this is in my half finished office here. As he pulls this from the Bay of San Francisco. Oh, look at that! The old F is that the uh, 
Oh wait, that well the filters killing. Yeah, it, but we'll have sixteen. It's, I think. Yeah, right. it's 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 the it's the scale Lego model of uh, <laughs> Rooster actually. Rooster. There we go. Rooster's F eighteen that nice. you know he got to fight for like eight minutes in before he had to a fucking eject thanks to getting you know shot down by some Sams. Um, no, I love that man. My kids got that for me for Christmas last year. Nice. It's like, yeah, I'm like a I'm like a Lego dork. I've got a Maersk uh, container ship somewhere around here that's like big as hell. What do you think about the what was it the Iranians that just landed on that that ship last week? It was the Houthi. It was the Houthi yeah. rebels using tactics they obviously learned from the IRGC. <laughs> but uh i mean I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie to you it, it was an impressive assault commando operation like it's it's i don't know but it gets to the point we didn't even cover any of that shit like but <clears throat> it gets to the point that you know as i talk to companies uh, about like what's your biggest risk and they're like well you know we haven't really identified it i'm like you source like 90 percent of your stuff out of india and the middle east and it's all got to go through the red sea you don't think you have any risk right now <laughs> like, <laughs> really yeah are you paying attention yeah. and you know that that was that was always the obvious play i think i said it like the first day the israeli shit popped off i'm like just start watching the red sea because it's going to get really sporty it's just it's the natural output of things but i mean if, if if we can see all of these things happening in that part of the world and, and we're still trying to like bribe the iranians not even the Iranians, the Ayatollahs and, and that yeah. fucking evil regime, because the Iranian people, the Persian people are awesome. Yeah. And, and, and just a tremendous culture that has shaped all of human history, mm -hmm. really almost back to its, its roots, but they're run by a bunch of psychopaths. And if, if we think that they're going to stop just because we're being nice, because we give them their nukes back, because we give them $17 billion in cash over the last 10 years, like if, if, if they think that shit's gonna stop. No, I mean that just I mean they're a bully, right? And they're a really big bully that happened to yeah. probably have some level of nuke. So it's like it's I don't know. We're prosecuting that we're completely different. We're entrenched in the Black Sea, we're entrenched in the Middle East now, and I'm just waiting for shit to get sporty in January or something, and, you know, in the Western Pacific. It's like, yeah, let's just let's see if nine carrier strike groups are equipped to fight through a three front war. No. Man, that's part three right there. Um, Let's do it. We can do a part three. I don't care. <laughs> we can talk about how Tom Cruise would win the war single hand. Yeah, let's do that. But we'll, we'll by, do it by the way, Maverick, one hundred percent. That is an Iranian. Like I have had these arguments with people. I'm like, guys, don't fuck with me. That is an Iranian uranium enrichment facility that he takes out. Yeah, Iran, Iran is the only country that's got operating F-14s from like way back in the day. And they're flying Su-57s, which they obviously borrowed from Russia, you know, for, for those particular men. People are like, oh, it's China. I'm like, it's not China. All of the fifth oh, it's gen pretty, fighters. Yeah, it's like, pretty the fighters, obvious. They're, they're it's SU, yeah, they're, they're Su-57s. Yeah. yeah, they launched that mission out of the fucking Persian Gulf. Yeah. And nobody wants to admit that, that you know, like a very small strike team of four F-18s managed to blow up a uranium enrichment facility and somehow safely land back on an aircraft carrier and busted ass F-14. Let's go. Spoiler alert, Tom Cruise goes to space at the beginning of the movie and it only gets more awesome. I know. And, and he... <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite scenes is when uh, that general shows up. He's like, <laughs> what does he say? Ed, Har Ed Harris, another one of my yeah, favorite Ed Harris. Actors. Ed Harris. He's uh... Or Francis X. Hummel, if you're a fan of The Rock like I am. Yeah, that's true. Which that just graced social media last week as well, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> the anniversary of him, uh, you know, uh, killing a bunch of Navy SEALs in a shower room of an old prison. Maybe in uh, the Rock. Yeah. <laughs> Your best losers always whine about doing their best. <laughs> social media is great. It doesn't let you forget anything. It doesn't, I and it reminds it. you of everything, which is also great. Um, it does. Thank God my high school years aren't on there. Like video, oh, right. like video cell phones. Like I just saw, the, uh, there, I just saw something like that on. that popped up. It was just like uh, high school in the 90s, but it was like a videotape of stuff of people showing up. And it's like, you know what? I am glad. Like somebody had to have the big like Sony. Yeah, exactly. It was know, a camera on the handheld. shoulder. There was no like I'm, that at a barbecue. When the compact came out, finally, the handheld. Like that was 
crazy. Oh, that was the game changer for Hunter Biden. That was like when he went from a boy to a man is when the handicam came out and he could, you know, he became a real film auteur. Oh, uh, Hunter. Where are you now? Where is Hunter now? Isn't he supposed to be on trial? Is that not happening? He's supposed to be. I think him and Amber Heard are hanging out talking about their respective oh, trials. That'd be a good one. That'd be a good Netflix. We're gonna see Hunter on the stand with the tissue, just you know, taking a taking a rip out of his pinky, and <laughs> everybody's gonna pretend like he's got the sniffles. He's a great artist, apparently. He, like he, he's a, he's a tremendous artist. You yeah, know, I, actually, I heard, that's uh, what they talked about that with 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 Rogan and Musk. They were showing Elon like his art, and they're like, oh, you know what? That's actually pretty good. <laughs> Because they're talking about art is just nothing more than like a money laundering scheme. It is. I, <laughs> that's like that's like one of my favorite things in like several movies. And what's hilarious is there's been some like highbrow movies that like talk about how art, you know, as as a form of as as a form of money trafficking. Um, and and then of all movies, like the critical lynch plot linchpin plot point of the movie is fucking chips. Uh. <laughs> which is a silly stupid movie the one with Dax Shepard and you know Michael Ramirez or whatever in it yeah. and but like the critical linchpin like plot point of the movie is that like these dirty cops are like laundering money <laughs> by by buying paintings I'm like that's pretty high brow for this movie you know or yeah it's uh but it is and it, it's it's been that way for a long long time you know it's like one of the few things that has a like, value on art it's either you want to pay for it or you don't yeah, it's exactly right. So it's it's, <laughs> it's like exactly. it, it, yeah, it always has an extrinsic value because you can't ever define the intrinsic value of it, yeah. right? So it's uh, as beneficial as art is for the world too. It's uh, like mo like most things, it's you know, subverted occasionally for bad. Tom Cruise should do a movie about. Uh, he might. Like, he probably has already done it. Like somewhere in between. Scott, uh, yeah, I'm sure in one of the 30 missions, like Caps and a few good are. men, when he's like yeah. mowing down National Guard soldiers, or whatever, with a fucking M60 in his dorm room, and like a few good men, when he's telling the good guy, the film Colonel Nathan Jessup, uh, you know, that he's a bad person. <laughs> I'll die on that hill. We'll do six hours about why Nathan Jessup is right. All right, there's part three. <laughs> Nathan Jessup and AI music. Let's go. Yeah, there. Yeah, with Anna Indiana as the soundtrack for the whole thing. It'd be great. <laughs> I was drinking my coffee. Oh, it's so good. Is it any worse though than that Friday song? Friday, Friday. Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. No, it doesn't um, surprise me to know that we're we're brothers from another mother. Everybody knows that song, and if they don't, they Nobody should. Knows. They should. It was the. It was one of the first Harley Jessup songs that actually like. Is she Nathan Jessup's daughter? Ooh, Carly Ray Jessup, right? Granddaughter, maybe. What if? What? All right, that's part. What if? <laughs> what if Demi Moore's character in the film actually was so taken with the raw machismo of Colonel Nathan Jessup that they that they coupled together and produced Harley the Ray chick that made Friday? Carly Ray Jessup. Hmm. All right, deep dive part three. Ross Kennedy, thanks for hanging out, brother. Thank you, man. Been a lot of All fun. Right, buddy.